Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out on this rainy Tuesday night. We appreciate that you're here. We are very excited to have you um, in the next event of our um, author performance series. I just want to take a minute to thank our friends organization. I know we all volunteer, we all do things, but it is a small core group of people who do so much for the library. They just finished a week-long book sale, a ton of work, and then they provide refreshments, and they're always doing things to raise money for the library so we can have cool programs like this. So please, if you want to donate to the Friends, you want to be a part of the Friends, you want to volunteer, but if anything, just please give them a hand. Thank you. So our guest this evening is a writer from our school sports, and he has worked for WEEI. He has two books. His newest book is Five Rings, about the Patriot Super Bowl. It's great Christmas gifts. He's happy to sign after he does his talk. So please, please welcome Jerry Thornton. Sharon, who's running this thing, the job that she's doing, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so she uh, mentioned, and thank you for that for that nice introduction, and, and let me let me just begin by saying, um, ordinarily, I would say if you have a cell phone, now would be a good time to turn it off. I don't care. Go ahead. Let it ring. I, you know, okay, you know you've, you've, you've got more important stuff than listening to my nonsense, but uh, if you have a page or a cell phone, now would be the perfect time to uh, get a cell phone, honest to God. I, you don't need a pager anymore, okay? Unless you're waiting from your glasses from Lens Crafters from 1987. Uh, get it, get yourself a cell phone. So, yeah, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, 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 yeah, like you're waiting for your reservation. I get that. No, now they just give you that coaster that buzzes, by the way. My wife always puts that in her front pocket. I don't know why that is. Uh, but that's not, that's neither here nor there. Um, so anyway, my name's Jerry Thornton, if I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, again, I, as Sharon said, I write for Barstool Sports. Uh, for a couple of years there, I was writing for uh, WEEI. I was on the uh, afternoon show with uh, Dale Holly and, and uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the Dale and Holly show with Thornton, uh, with uh, Dale Arnold and Michael Holly. Uh, I loved that job. That was a terrific job. I loved going on for four hours a day to talk about sports. I went back to Barstool because it's an even better opportunity. It's a chance for me to focus mo mainly on the Patriots and the NFL in general, which are my first loves. Uh, when I was at EEI, a couple of the things that I got to do that was really great was interview athletes and coaches and newsmakers. Um, I also had a podcast, which I, I love to do, because the podcast to me was a chance to talk about things other than sports. So I had on uh, guests, I had, I've been doing comedy for 25 years. Don't let the fact that you have never heard of me discourage you from the fact that, yes, I do do comedy. Um, I'll be working at Quan's Kitchen in Hanover in a couple of weeks. Yes, my career has really skyrocketed. I'm so, I'm so glad I turned down Vegas so that I could work at a Chinese restaurant in, in Hanover, Mass. But, um, so I would have on my comedian buddies. I had on some uh, uh, reality TV stars. I had on a Cambridge firefighter who won Survivor, which was amazing to me because I'm still a Survivor nerd to this day. Um, I had the amazing Kreskin on my podcast. The amazing Kreskin, a guy who has done show business now for 65 years, who was on The Tonight Show before Johnny Carson was on The Tonight Show, came on my goofy little thing. Um, I had on a guy who served with Chris Kyle, the American sniper, who had uh, written uh, his book. So I loved having book authors on, and whenever I, when I had him on or anybody else, my first question was always, why? Let's start the conversation there. Why did you write this book? Because when you write a book, granted, the world comes to you to tell you how amazing you are and how talented and how handsome, and they just bring you wheelbarrows filled with money. That's my reality. I mean, men want to be you. Women want to be with you. You create feelings in others they themselves can't comprehend. But that's not why you write a book. You should have some other ulterior motive. I've written these... And I will ask back that question, then I will answer it. I've written both of these books because, frankly, I always wanted to read them. And I waited and waited, and the universe was taking its sweet time getting around to it. I said, to heck with it. I'll be the one to jump on the grenade. The reason I wrote both of them is because what I think we've witnessed with the Patriots, and the first book, From Darkness to Dynasty, is really from their inception until, spoiler alert, they became a dynasty. Now, not to give away the ending, but it's right there in the title, you know. I mean, we all watched Titanic, right? You saw where that thing was going from the beginning. And 
Sometimes it's in the title, like Finding Nemo. <laughs> Spoiler alert, he finds Nemo uh, at the end. So the, um, the reason I wanted to tell that story is because I think it's unique in all of American society, not just sports, but in everything. Hi, how are you guys? Come on in, grab a seat. Let me just start at the beginning. Hi, I'm Jerry. No, uh, no you haven't missed anything. Grab a seat, what a call. Um, yeah, because a little bit about me. I grew up in Weymouth. Anybody here from the South Shore? You're, okay, cool. So when you guys are talking to us, talk slow, because uh, we're, not, we're not as sharp as the North Reading people. Uh, certainly Weymouth is not. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm the youngest of five, and I grew up in a household where the Patriots were our number one thing. During a time when none of the Boston teams could ever take a backseat to the Patriots, not one of them, where nobody had the Patriots as their favorite team. When I was a kid, you know, Bobby Orr was huge. If you live anywhere within a hundred mile radius of a skating rink, it's because Bobby Orr was signed by the Bruins. Uh, when I was in high school, the Celtics drafted Larry Bird, and they rebooted a dynasty. The Red Sox were always front and center. They were always number one team, everyone's number one team. To say back then that the Patriots were your favorite team was unheard of. It, it was like someone saying, so who's your favorite one of the three Stooges? And you say, I really like Shemp. <laughs> Thank you, because Shemp is a nightmare, right? Nobody likes, likes him. But the Patriots were, I don't know what it was. My brothers kind of raised me to be into them more than the other teams. They were like that stray dog that followed me home, that I fell in love with, even though they, you know, he had two different colored eyes and three legs and mangy and was missing a tail. Uh, for whatever reason, they just made that imprint on me. The Patriots of my youth were not just terrible on the field, there were laughing stocks off the field. Uh, the book begins with stuff that predated even me, how this, their owner, a guy named Billy Sullivan, got entry into the old American Football League, which is now the American Football Conference because it, it was absorbed by the uh, uh, NFL. Well, what it, what it was was a group of seven guys who called themselves the Foolish Club because they felt they had no business starting a football league to try to take on the NFL. They needed an eighth guy, and the only team, the biggest city rather, that didn't have a team in their league was Boston. So these seven guys were all multi-multi-millionaires. There were real estate tycoons and, and oil barons and guys that owned hotel chains. The guy that they got from Boston was a gentleman by the name of Billy Sullivan who ran an oil company in Boston. That was it. I mean, running an oil company in Boston is like being the most successful lobster fisherman in, like, Oklahoma. This guy had no claim to fame. What he had was some money that he and his wife had been saving to buy a cottage down the Cape. And he bought entry into this room full of millionaires. So what he got on that first day was a piece of paper that said he now owned a team. He didn't have a team. He had no players. He, the league didn't exist. He didn't have any coaches. He didn't have anyone who had ever built a football team. He didn't have a stadium. So for the first 11 years, the Patriots played their home games in, uh, let's see, they had, they started at BU. Uh, then they were at Boston College. They upgraded that to Harvard Stadium. Uh, they were in Fenway Park for a while, which the players actually liked. They actually thought that was like a, a big upgrade. Like, hey, at least this is a professional place. At least this isn't some college locker room like, like Ted Williams used to dress in this room, but you have all been to Fenway, right? You all know the layout of the place, and you know that Fenway is a great place for baseball, but is a uniquely terrible place to put a football stadium, right? Like, they, they play games there once in a while, like, a, you know, BC has played Notre Dame there before. So you know the layout of the place, how they, they put one end zone by home plate, and the other one was out by the right field bleachers. Well, the problem with that is the really good seats along the sidelines are the worst seats in the house because no one could see a bloody thing from all the players standing in their way. So what they did is they put both benches out on the left field side of the field. See if you can see the problem with this design. You put two teams of 50 football players on the same sidelines. 
and just told them, okay, we're on the honor system, fellas. Like, don't be listening to other people's conversations. Well, what happened is, routinely, players would just, like, walk into the other team's sideline and then just come back over and go, okay, I heard them. They're talking about running the ball more. Only the Patriots would have done that. Um, when they finally did get a stadium of their own, it was a place down in Foxborough, and the book's kind of semi-autobiographical, and that it's me remembering when I went there for the first time. Now, uh, I think most of us, your first sporting event is your dad takes you to Fenway, right? Like that's kind of baseball, and you know, kids understand it, and it's sort of timeless, and it's like a beautiful summer day. Didn't work out for me. My dad passed away when I was young. So it was my brothers taking me to the stadium in Foxborough. And I can remember like it was yesterday. I have this vivid memory of walking up that ramp. And I'm all excited because I'm going to see a professional football stadium. Like I've never done this before. This is going to be great. All those games I watch on Sunday, you know, these big teams and these big stadiums, the Cowboys and the Steelers and the you know, 49ers or whatever. And I remember like it was yesterday, I walked up that ramp, and I looked around, and the first thing I said to them was, you know, I'm just a kid, but even I know that this place is a dump. <laughs> right? You remember that place? It was like four sets of like poured concrete. It looked like Eastern Block architecture, right, with those aluminum bench seats that you would sit on, and, and the seats were like just a number stuck on there that were all about this far apart. Like, anorexic lingerie models could have sit in the seats that they were assigned. Instead, it was 350-pound fat guys from Revere or whatever wedged into these things. And th those aluminum would, like, just suck the heat right out of your body through the back of your thighs. Right? Like, if you went to a game in November, your core body temp wouldn't get back up to 98.6 till, like, July of the following year. Right, you'd be at the bench and all of a sudden just say, oh, okay, I'm not having the chills anymore. It's from that stupid game I went to. Um, and the, you remember what the, the place was called when it first opened? Schaefer Stadium. Schaefer Stadium, right. During a time where nobody did what we today accept as called, you know, selling the naming rights to the stadium. Like, they built Gillette Stadium back in 2002. I think Gillette Razors spent like $30 million to get that thing built. Well, nobody did it back then. If you built a stadium, you gave it this like idealistic name, this, this high-minded, inspirational title like uh, Soldier Field in Chicago, or Veteran Stadium in Philadelphia, War Memorial Coliseum. They not only sold the naming rights to a company, which was really a bad taste back then, it was to a beer and not just any beer. Schaefer was the worst swill that has ever been brewed, according to a can. Right? Right? We, right? we live in a world where beers went away and were brought back, right? Like Pax Blue Ribbon with, is big with hipsters. Or uh, Narragansett, I thought, was extinct. And it's back with a vengeance. They've got like IPAs and summer ales and Oktoberfests or whatever. No one's asking for Schaefer to come back, right? Yeah. Do you remember what its, its slogan was? Schaefer is the one beer to have when you're having more than one. <laughs> Take a look at that through 2018 sensibilities for one hot second, right? Try, try slipping that one past Mothers Against Drug Driving, you know? Yeah, I'll tell you right now, this thing basically tastes like sewer water, but if you drink enough of it, you really don't taste it. Right. <laughs> drink up, kids. Have them in volume. Uh, when you went to a game there, too, it wasn't so much a football game as much as it was a breakdown of societal order. Right? It was like humanity had turned into like a termite mound. It, it, was, it was Lord of the Flies with goalposts at either ends. Like where the, the most famous incident they ever had there was the Monday night game. Where you, I think some of you remember where I'm going with this. That was where they found out that when kickoff is at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday, people hit the parking lot and really start abusing the alcohol at like 9 or 10 in the morning. And when the game is at 9 o'clock at night, like it was back then, people hit the parking lot and start really abusing the alcohol at 9 or 10 in the morning. Uh, 12 hours of solid drinking before kickoff of this thing. And basically, it was, in no uncertain terms, it was a riot. It was the purge, is what it was. So, like, Howard Cosell stopped talking about the game 
and was just describing the chaos that was unfolding beneath them. They had so many arrests that the police station ran out of space in the lockup, so they just took to handcuffing guys to a chain link fence. Well, people just went by throwing stuff at them and spitting at them, right? It was, it was like when they put you in the stockade at Plymouth Plantation in like 1625 or whatever. Um, they had a moment and boy, I don't even know if I should go here. I don't, I, looking back, it's less, it used to be tragic funny, but now it's just straight up tragic, but it actually happened. The research, I, I looked it up and I found it did, where a guy at that Monday night game had cardiac arrest, and the EMT was working on him, trying to resuscitate him, and the EMT felt something on his back, and he turned around, and there was literally a grown man standing there urinating on his back while he was working on him. Yes, yes, feel free to recoil in horror. That was, that actually happened. Um, there was a time where the, the team actually got good and made the playoffs, and Patriots fans managed to find a way to ruin that, too. Uh, you, you, there's a, that expression in sports, act like you've been there before. Like you get in the end zone, you don't need to celebrate or spike the ball or do a dance or whatever. Well, the Patriots really hadn't been there before. So the fans didn't know how to act. So when they win this, this game to clinch a playoff spot, everyone stormed the field and they tore down the goalposts. Like not in a malicious way, but just kind of in a lame kind of half-assed old way that college teams used to do. But, you know, it was cute, but it was out of date when they did it. But when college kids used to do it, they dropped the things on the ground, and they went back to their dorms, and they drank probably Schaefer. Uh, Patriots fans didn't know what to do, so they took the thing with them. <laughs> so they, they walked the goalpost up the ramp, and then down the hill, and then across the parking lot, and we're hitting up Route 1 with this thing. Now what the end game was, I have no idea. Like maybe they drew straws and someone was gonna put it in his driveway or maybe they were gonna take turns or whatever. I don't, we'll never know because what happened is these morons found out what happens when thin-walled steel hits low-hanging high-tension wires. Yes, a group of them got electrocuted and survived and went on to sue the team. Yes, and, and a couple of them won, and won, won millions of dollars on this. Now, uh, I don't know what part of them got the most badly burned, but I always like to think that it was uh, their reproductive system. So that they won't have equally stupid people to water down the gene pool like their parents did. Um, and that, that, by the way, that's in the book, and I got an angry email from this woman who said, in that part where you're talking about the goalposts, how dare you call those people idiots? Because one of them happened to be my husband. <laughs> and he wasn't even carrying that thing. He was just walking up the street, minding his own business. Right. right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because, look, I, I might not have been the best science student in the world, but I learned enough to know that electricity doesn't skip over the guy who's carrying the metal and leap across the street and zap some innocent bystander, right? Who just happens to be on a stroll with 40,000 other morons up Route 1. No. Basically what that guy obviously told his wife is what I would tell my wife if I did something egregiously stupid 30 years ago and made money out of it. Um, so, yeah, it was, it's a lot about that. It's about the Patriots back then their fans being bad about them being not just losers on the field and laughing stocks off of it. It's about them being the worst thing you can be in American society. The one thing we cannot forgive you from ever being is irrelevant. Right? Where their home games weren't on TV because they couldn't sell out. There were times when they'd only get on TV because the local station would like buy out the extra tickets just so they could have something to put on TV instead of some stupid Elvis movie or whatever. Um, it's about me in those days having to listen to the home games on my stupid clock radio in my room while all the normal kids were out in the street playing. Um, it was uh, my favorite thing this time of year when I was little and it's, unfortunately it's pretty much extinct at this point, but you guys remember the Sears catalog? The Christmas catalog, the wish book? Oh God, that was like the Bible of, of kingdom back then. And it was this thick of just pages of NFL stuff. Like anything you wanted you could get, you could get like replica helmets or jerseys or sweatshirts. 
If you like the team, you could do your whole bedroom just in that team's merchandise, right? Like bedspreads and wastebaskets and pillowcases and pennants or whatever. And underneath all of them, at the bottom, in little agate type, it would just say, not available on the following teams, Patriots. <laughs> because they had factories full of these workers going, are we really going to waste our time to making this crap that no one's going to buy? You know, maybe the Thornton kid in Weymouth, but he's not going to buy it. Um, well, the second book is not about those patriots. It's not about the patriots that were irrelevant. It's about the patriots that we've known for the last, counting on 20 years, that have gone from irrelevant to hyper-relevant, where they've become so much front and center of football, when football isn't just America's favorite sport, it's America's favorite thing. It's the only thing that gets more popular with each passing year, with the rise of things like fantasy football and NFL Red Zone. It's the only show on television where the ratings go up every single year. And you know, in a fractured world where we've got cable and, and YouTube and we've got all these apps and you know, even playlists, and Spotify, everyone's doing their own form of entertainment. Football is more popular now than it ever was before. And the Patriots have been front and center of that this entire time, both on the field, where they've been winning all the time, where they've been like the, the center of the conversation, and off the field, where they've gone from being, like I said, irrelevant, to for a very short window of time, they were beloved by people, to becoming the most hated, despised institution in American pop culture. I say pop culture, we'll put Washington DC aside for a second and say that the Patriots are the only thing that's maybe more despised even than like say Nickelback. <laughs> Thank you for getting the Nickelback reference, those of you who are under the age of uh, 60 in the room. Um, it's to the point where, well uh, let, me, let me address this from different perspectives here. What they've done on the field, what the, the, the controversies that have been in, involved with off the field, and what it's done to both the rest of the country and to us. So on the field, for starters, they've been to eight Super Bowls in this era. It, it, a, a record that will probably never be broken. In a world where the Super Bowl was always the worst sporting event of the year, right? If you remember before the Patriots came along and started going to these things every year, do you remember what those were like? It would be like a four-touchdown blowout by halftime. You know, like, God forbid it was the Bills against the Cowboys again. And you know, all right, well, this is going to be another game. We'll, we'll watch the halftime show, and the whole second half is going to be, say, how did you make this dip? Is this really good? You know, like, the, the game would be going on. Everyone would be having conversations. You'd, like, shush each other for the commercials. Like, oh, quiet. Hey, the Dalmatian's going to make friends with the Clydesdale or whatever. Well, the Patriots come along. And the games haven't just been competitive, they have been balancing on a razor's edge, every single one of them. Let me just run through them quickly. There had never been a game that ended on the final play, a scoring play at the end. The Patriots go to the Super Bowl in 2001 against the Rams. If you remember, they blew a late lead against a great Rams team. They were huge underdogs. John Madden is sitting there, the game's tied with a minute and a half to go, and he's going, Oh, if I'm the Patriots right now, I'd just take a knee and I'd just play it for overtime. I don't know what they're doing here. I just... Well, they didn't. They went for it. They go ahead. They kick a game-winning field goal to win it at the end. A couple of years later, they have an interception on the final play. They're taking a knee. That final interception came with, like, seconds to go on the clock. That iced the game. A year later, they go, they play the Carolina Panthers, Again, another game that ends with a final drive, with a field goal to win it as the clock runs out. A few years later, after that, they played the Giants. Yeah, should we just skip right over that? No. A game that ended on an impossible catch by a nobody, an absolute nobody named David Tyree. If the bunch of us grabbed a football and enough canned goods to survive a week, and we went out in this parking lot and tried to recreate that stupid catch, we would never be able to. That's a little moment I like to call the Super Bowl that shall not be named. <laughs> Two year, a few years later, four years later, they play the Giants again, a thing I like to call the Super Bowl that shall not be named, part two. Again, it ends on an incredible catch by another nobody named Mario Manningham. Catches one over his shoulder that ended up like basically being a, a game winner. Uh, that, by the way, is the worst sequel since the Second World War. You could look it up. Uh, 
A few years later after that, they go, they play the Seahawks. They're clinging to a lead late in the game. Seahawks throw another desperate catch. It's caught by a guy named Jermaine Curse, who, it looked for all the world like it was incomplete. It hit off his knee, it bounced off his shin, off his toe, went up, hit him over the back of the head, went up one nostril, out the other nostril, bounced off his elbow. He catches the thing, he gets up and gets knocked out of bounds by this undrafted rookie court, backup cornerback by the name of Malcolm Butler that no one had ever heard of. And, and by the way, while he did that, my brother turned to me and said, God hates us! <laughs> and that Jermaine catch, the, the catch by Jermaine Curse, was caught at the same end of the same stadium where David Tyree had made the catch in 2007. Like, this is uh, absolutely surreal and unheard of, but what saves the day is that same undrafted nobody named Malcolm Butler who makes an interception on the goal line. The single greatest play in Super Bowl history was made by a guy who wasn't even good enough to start the game. The very next year, they go, and now they're playing, uh, I'm sorry, not the, the very next year, two years later, they're playing uh, the Atlanta Falcons, and they fall behind by three touchdowns. Uh, raise your hand if you thought they were going to win it at that point. <laughs> really? <laughs> Liar! Get out of my room! I will not listen to you! Really? Which one? Really? You're a, you're, a better, you're a better man than I, Doug and Dan. I respect that. I really do. Because I don't... I. I imagine a lot of you had the same uh, reaction to it I did, where um, right around the time Tom Brady throws a pick six and it goes returned the other way, and now they're down by 25 points, my guests all filed out because we were not having a lick of fun. I wish you were with me. I wish you would talk me off the ledge because they no sooner left after that pick six, I started noticing, okay, pupils dilated, Left shoulder is numb. I got on WebMD and found out I was having what they called stroke-like symptoms. Uh, they had a they they punt. It looks like you know, they're losing time on the clock. The clock's bleeding down. I sit there and I at that point I actually um, left my body and I was hovering above the couch looking down at myself. Uh, they score, but now they need a two-point conversion. They get it. Uh, it gets down to. Uh, Overtime, they tie this thing up. There was a shaft of light appearing in the ceiling, and my ancestors were waving to me to come <laughs> join them. Uh, it goes for the coin flip in overtime, and I am praying for the sweet release of death at that point. But they go down, and now no Super Bowl had ever gone to overtime before. They not only take this thing to overtime, they run, the, run it down the Falcons' throw. They win the game. I'm not ashamed to say that uh, I got a call from my son, who uh, is 22 now, so at that time he would have been 20. He's seen them go to eight Super Bowls in his lifetime. When I was his age, my dream was to see them win one playoff game before I died. <laughs> the first three Super Bowls, he was sitting on the couch next to me. Um, the final three, he has been away with the United States Marine Corps. And uh, I'm not, a, oh, you're very nice, thank you very much. I'm, I'm not ashamed to say he cried, he called me from his barracks, surrounded by people who hate the Patriots, and I was crying real tears on the phone. Uh, I'm in a single manly tear, like Spartacus, I'm not, you know, I'm not, not a blithering idiot. No, who am I kidding? It was like, it was like me watching Toy Story 3 and getting pepper sprayed, like crying, ugly face tears, I'm not ashamed to admit it. Um, Following year, they go back to the Super Bowl against the Eagles. Again, a game that comes down to two or three plays. Our quarterback doesn't catch a pass. Their quarterback does catch a pass. They score in fourth and goal. What are you going to do? The book's called Five Rings. It's not called Six Rings. But th what they did in this era has been absolutely unprecedented. And what they have done to the rest of the country while they've been doing this is also unprecedented. I mean, where do I begin? The controversies, the rules changes, the, the way they have triggered everybody. They have created such a Patriots derangement syndrome out <laughs> of the 44 states outside of New England that it's unprecedented in all of American society. So everything that they've done has brought about either a reaction of their cheaters or we've got to stop them with rules. I'll go back to 2003. That was the Super Bowl when they um, beat the, the uh, Eagles. In the playoffs, they beat Peyton Manning's uh, Colts by being physical. 
by just being tougher than them, by getting their hands on their receivers, keeping them from getting in their routes. The Colts actually went to the league after the season and got them to change the rules on how you can cover guys in order to stop the Patriots. A few years later, 2007, first week of the season, the Patriots are caught, and this was illegal, and they did it, you're not supposed to, they pointed a camera at the sideline of the Jets to look at their signals. To be clear, you could point a camera at the other team's sidelines, but there's a designated area in the stadium where you're allowed to do it from. The Patriots guy, instead of doing it from there, did it from over here. And that was treated like a felony. It was treated like an absolute mass murder. Like what should have been basically a parking ticket, they pay a fine, was, was treated as, you got, they lost draft picks, there were people saying that they shouldn't ever like be able to, none of their Super Bowls counted. There, there were people that believe to this day that what they were actually guilty of was taping the, the Rams' practices before the Super Bowl. Because the Herald put that on the front page of the paper and then retracted it three months later and said there's no truth to it. But it stands to this day. Spygate, the greatest crime in the history of American society. Until a few years later, well, the little thing called the flake gate. Let me, let me back up a second before I get too deep into the flake gate. 2014, they played the, the Ravens in the playoffs. And the Pats are down by 14, twice in the game. And the way they came back was trick formations. Now they had checked with the league ahead of time and said, can we do this? Can we line up in this formation? This guy is the legal receiver. This guy is going to stay in a block. The league said, oh yeah, you can do that. The day before, they checked with the officials and said, can we line up this way? And the officials said, sure, okay, we'll, we'll know what you're doing. Great. They ran it while the Ravens lost their damn minds. While their coach ran out onto the field and took a penalty while his head exploded like a Cronenberg film. Oh, they can't do that. And the officials were saying, yeah, they can. So the Patriots line up in it again. And the official literally did this. It's never happened before or since. He told the Ravens, don't cover number 34. <laughs> while they covered number 34 and left number 68 wide open to catch a pass up the scene. Well, the, Col the Pats end up winning that game. The, the Ravens were so mortified by this that they did two things. They got the rule changed after the season to say you can't do that anymore. In the short term, what they did is they contacted the Patriots' next opponent, the Colts, and told them, we think they take the air out of footballs. This became a bigger scandal than Spygate. The deflate gate, and I've, I've waited this long to use the D word, but the deflate gate wasn't the biggest story in sports. It was the biggest story in the United States of America. For two weeks, it led the network newscasts. Like, you flip in to find out what's happened with the war on terror or, like, the election. It was the worst winter on record, and what you got instead was, live from New York, here's Joe Forehead. Thank you. Tonight, the big news. Did the quarterback of the Patriots squeeze some air out of footballs? Let's take a look. And they actually did, they actually looked into this in a way that has never happened before since what, if true, should have been a, like a $25,000 equipment fine. Like along the lines of having your socks droop and not, not touch the pants of a uniform was turned into the integrity of the game is in question. The Bats were going to the Super Bowl. There were people who literally thought that Bill Belichick should not be allowed to go to the Super Bowl. That the Patriots shouldn't go, it should be the Colts. Now, a couple things about this. It began with, or to, to hear the story told, a guy from the Colts named Dequell Jackson intercepted a pass from Brady and then took it to the sidelines and said, hey, fellas, does this ball feel kind of squishy to you? And the players took it and said, wow, it seems a little underinflated. What are we going to do about this? And the league put a needle in it. That story is so false, and yet it ended up in the court documents. The court documents, by the way, that brought this case one step away from the Supreme Court of the United States of America almost heard this. The people that heard, you know, Tom Brady, uh, that, that heard Brown versus the Board of Education almost decided Tom Brady and two pounds per square inch and some footballs. Well, J Jackson says it didn't happen. He was on Barstool Radio last month saying that never happened, but it's been the part of the whole belief system of the, this whole thing. 
Deflategate is the most overrated, overwrought, phony baloney scandal in the history of the world. And the way you can tell this is, the league said afterwards, we're going to measure all the footballs. We're going to release those figures. We're going to tell everybody what they are, because this speaks to the integrity of the game. And everybody remember doing that? Anyone remember them releasing those figures? No, I thought the following year those footballs were going to be delivered to the field by a Bricks truck. Surrounded by armed guards like the Pope was coming out in the, in the Pope mobile. No, in fact, the following year, the Pats had a game in Foxborough, and the referees stayed in a hotel in Boston the night before, and they got to the stadium, and the guys were like, uh, where are the footballs? What? You have them? No, I thought you brought them. No, you brought them. They left them in their hotel room in Boston. There was an hour to go in the game. They had to call the hotel and have the concierge break into the room and get the balls and have the state police bring them down to the stadium. But a Patriots employee took the balls that night against the Colts and had them in the bathroom for 90 seconds, and therefore it was the biggest scandal in the history of, of the world. Um, so this, this, the whole dynamic of that speaks to how the world has seen the Patriots during this whole period of success. There's a great line in uh, The Dark Knight where they say, you either die a hero or you live long enough to see yourself become the victim. The victim? To be see yourself become the villain, excuse me. That's what the Patriots have done. They have made the critical mistake of not going away. They've stayed excellence for 19 years and so the rest of the country has just learned to hate them. They dread the fact that they're going to win when they do win, it calls into question everything that their team does, so they say, oh no, it's some other thing. It's the cheating. It's we have to change the rules. It's there's Nazis behind the wood pile. There are actual coaches that have admitted when they go to Gillette, they have their meetings in the hallway because they think the Patriots have listening devices in the locker room. Uh, when, when, remember a couple years ago, the Steelers played here, and their... Uh, Hel the helmet radio started picking up the Patriots radio broadcast instead of the coaches on the sidelines. They thought the Patriots were jamming their signal. Right, that lighthouse is just a big Tesla tower, right? It's just a big wireless guided thing to like jam your, your signals. We're listening to everything you do, but they believe it. And it's brilliant because the more that they think that these things are happening, that this is how the Pats are winning, the less they realize they're just better coached, they're better prepared. They find guys that are serious about football. They're not worried about listening devices. They're worried about how they can get better. Um, and so what has happened is the media has glommed on to this. They've been part of this whole thing. The Boston media, the national press, the ESPN has been the driving force behind so much of this. But what it's done to them has been great for us, for Patriots fans. Like, we, are, we have become, because of all this stuff, the most galvanized, engaged, plugged in, and motivated fan base in all the world. And it's been brilliant to watch this happen. I was worried for a little while that we were going to get complacent. You know, like, like how Yankee fans sort of have that entitlement about them. Like, oh, we've won 727 championships and we deserve to win them all. And when we win, we win, it's not fun. But when we lose, we're really bad. When everyone fired. I, f I was afraid we were getting there. But instead, what we have uh, done, have circled the wagons around this team. The more people accuse them of cheating, the more energized we've become. I I'll give you a great example of this. And then I'll, I'll start to wrap up a little bit. I'd love to take questions or whatever. But um, Jerry Rice was picked by NFL Network as the best player in NFL history. He went on TV during the flake gate and said, I think Tom Brady's a, a cheater. And I think everything he's done doesn't count. And all those Super Bowls don't matter. Within an hour, Patriots fans found out that he had done an interview where he said, oh, when I was playing, I used to put stick them on my gloves. It was illegal, but I would get away with it because the referees weren't looking for it. And Pats fans just bombarded him on Twitter saying, hey, Rice, how about all your championships? How about your MVPs? I guess those don't count, huh? Jerry Rice, the number one player in NFL history, went off the grid. He was like Jason Bourne, like you couldn't find him. No one knew what had happened to him. He stopped going on Twitter. He stopped giving interviews. Why? Because he was afraid 
the Pats fans were going to fly out of the witch's castle like monkeys and jump on him and tear the stuffing out of him. It was beautiful to watch. And it's all happened, and it did so many things have had to fall exactly into place in order to make this happen. Going back to 2001, going back to Drew Bledsoe, who was the highest paid player in football, rolling out on an ordinary play and getting hit by Mo Lewis of the Jets. Clean hit, but actually literally almost killed Bledsoe. He was bleeding internally. Nobody knew about it. He came back out on the field for three plays, and only when he started sounding like talking ragtime and being confused did they say, look, we gotta get this guy out of here. If that doesn't happen, Maybe Tom Brady doesn't ever come into that game. Maybe he doesn't come in at all. Maybe he comes in too late in the season to ever become Tom Brady. Maybe they don't win that Super Bowl. Maybe they never win one. We'll never know. Um, a moment that I think where it really changed and made this permanent, this, this era of you know, horribleness, this era of success, was the snowball game which was the last game ever played in the old lousy stadium I mentioned. Also the best game ever played in that stadium. And in this like weird perfect metaphor, while they were playing that last game in that old downtrodden, dilapidated place, their new state-of-the-art place was being built up above it. Like you could look at the new construction while this team was going from the worst franchise in the world to the gold standard of excellence. And, you know, we call it the snowball game. Just so you know, anybody outside of New England calls it the tuck roll game. Right. It's like when you go down south and you mention the Civil War and they go, we call that the War of Northern Aggression, Yankee. Uh, and it all because Brady went back to pass. The Patriots were down three. They had no timeouts left. Ball, he gets hit. The ball comes loose. Oakland dives on it. It looked like the season's over. And the official went over and looked at the replay and said uh, his arm was going forward by the tuck rule, as they called it. And it had been called before. Don't let anyone tell you it wasn't called before. It was called against the Patriots in the game where Bledsoe got hurt, but no one remembers it. He said, no, nope, it's Patriots ball. Now, fine point on that. Um, I was talking to a group of people like you one time not long ago. And this older gentleman stood up and he said, um, that play you're talking about? I said, yeah. He goes, uh, I was working that game for the NFL. I, he was working the sidelines, like, you know, the guy that holds, like, the, the stick with the first down mark or whatever. And he said when they reversed the call, they said, okay, it's Patriots ball going this way. And this guy and his crew said, uh, hold on a second, it's, the ball should be five yards up this way because that's where Oakland recovered, but it's an incomplete pass, so it goes back to the original line of scrimmage. And the official said, oh, oh you're right, you're right, okay, good, good get. Well... Vinatieri's kick through the snow was good by three yards. They had moved the ball up five yards. So if it wasn't for this guy, that pick, kick would have been short and the Patriots lose. I go, dude, you're Forrest Gump. Like, you're, a wit you're a witness to history. Good for you, you know. Where's your parade? Uh, so uh, there's a million moments like that. They've all been great. I could talk all night about them. I will not because I'd rather hear from, from you guys. Um, I, I will just end with, uh, let, me, let me just end with this. There's one, one part that I think kind of speaks to um, just how long the Patriots have been this successful and how unheard of it is. Because if you know, if you look at old like YouTube videos of like the early parts of this dynasty, it's all like low def. You know, it's like watching old black and white films. Like it's in that four by three aspect ratio instead of like you know, like the widescreen like we're, we're used to. So just keep in mind this as I can as I find this page about how long that they've been this good. Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Now this uh, this will kind of make that point. Look at the world today and how it was back then when they first broke through and became good. In the spring of 2002, the Patriots had become the next big thing. For a fairly spot-on comparison, picture the opening montage of Rocky III, which starts with Balboa, and I'm not giving you a spoiler alert for this, winning the title at the end of Rocky II. You should know that by now. Uh, and then landing on the cover of every magazine, credit card ads, and on The Muppet Show. Adam Vinatieri had become a household name in a way that probably no place kicker ever had. He guessed it on Late Night with David Letterman, 
sitting on the desk with uh, at the desk with Dave in uber stylish leather pants. Then came a bit with Letterman took him on the roof of a building to kick footballs onto the parking garage across the street. What was more significant than the obvious danger of booting footballs all over a crowded block in downtown Manhattan was who Letterman had standing on the other roof in the dark waiting to field Vinatieri's kicks. Donald J. Trump. <laughs> Let me ask you a question, Letterman began. Is Donald Trump bothering you? Uh, I'll tell you something truthful. We didn't even ask him to come up here. We just found him standing on the roof of the parking garage. I think he's up there every night. Imagine you could go back in time to 2002 and say, okay, 2018, Vinatieri will still be kicking footballs in the NFL. Letterman will uh, be on a thing called Netflix. And the other guy, ah, never mind. You're, you're just going to have to fight out for yourself. So, so it's been great. I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the books. I tried to make them funny. I, I wasn't going to just write some dusty history tome. I would die before I just churned out something that was all just facts and dates or whatever. Um, I'll tell you this and then throw it out to you guys. But um, when I first got the first book in my hands, I was working at EEI. And part of my job, the coolest part of my job, coolest part of my life, maybe. My wife's not here. She won't know that I said that. Uh, but she would understand was getting to interview Bill Belichick once a week. Like sitting me to you away from Belichick asking him questions. And he was so cool to me. Like I really enjoyed that. And so when I got a copy of the book, my wife said, you really should give him one. Like, just offer him one. I go, okay, but what if he doesn't want it? What if it's awkward? I don't know. Ah, well. well, this particular day was one of those days, I don't know if you're aware of this, he has a reputation for being a kind of a grumpy pants. <laughs> yeah, this was one of those days. He was, he was Mr. Persnickety on that day. Uh, I think it was a bad day of practice, I don't know, and he only had a short window of time to talk to us, and I, 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 it's just, you know, monosyllable, syllabic answers. So we're over, when it was over, I go, hey, Bill, just before you go, look, oh, I have a book. Look, I wrote a book. It's, look, my name's on it. You're in it. Like, you know, spoiler alert, you win the Super Bowl or whatever. And he was like, his whole demeanor changed, and he was so cool to me. He's like, wow, this is great. Congratulations. That's, that's quite a thing. I'm, I'm really happy for you. I'll take it. Thanks. Take it with my compliments. And he left the room, and a minute went by, full minute, and he came back in. And he said, Jerry, I hate to bother you, but can I ask you to sign this for me? Yeah. Oh, oh, my God, Jesse! Like a little kid meeting the ball Santa. Like, I think I froze, or I giggled, or I, 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 I maybe I leaked a little bit. I don't know. But, um, yeah, he says, i got to run to my press conference. Just bring it back next week, if you could. I'll like, sure, you got it. Okay. And uh, it's a good thing, because my hand was like this. It was like all shaking. So he took it with him. And I like to think that he's got a collection of books that's like the Library of Alexandria, and somewhere in there is my goofy little tome about, you know, going to Gillette, uh, Foxborough Stadium when the toilets didn't work or whatever, and I'm, I'm proud. It's been a fun journey. The most fun part of it is getting to meet other Pats fans and communicate with, with you guys and feeling like we've got this kindred thing, this community, and the more the rest of the world hates them, the more fun it is to be us. You know, the more they win, obviously, the more fun. How did, how did Princess Leia put it? Governor Tarkin, the harder you squeeze, your, you tighten your grip, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. And knowing that somewhere Roger Goodell hates the fact that we exist is a great thing because his birth is the punishment for the sins of mankind. I can promise you that. And not enough bad things can happen. So it's a... It's an amazing journey. It's still going on. There's nothing like it. Any institution in American culture that's gone from this bad to this great. And I don't feel like an insider, but I damn sure feel like I've been sitting on the front row of the outside for this whole this whole journey. So um, I want to hear from you guys. I'll take any questions or comments. But my name is Jerry. Thanks for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Oh, sec the second best game ever. Okay. Um, 
I would like say, yeah. Snowplow game. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm happy to talk about the snowplow game. I will say this. Yeah, I, it, it's funny how history just has a tendency sometimes to put you in the place where you were meant to be at the, at the right time. And for me, it was in front of a microphone when the Flakegate was going on. And when the story first broke, it was late on a Monday. And it was that famous tweet by uh, Chris Mortensen of ESPN that said, 11 of the 12 balls were underinflated by 2 pounds per square inch. And real, real, let me quickly interject. Do you know where the, that range of air pressure on a football, where that rule comes from? The, the back of the box that a Wilson football comes in says recommended inflation rate from 12 and a half to 14 and a half, or whatever, 12 and a half to 14 percent. Like, like, so that became like a commandment somehow, I don't know. Well, that night I went to bed wondering what is this thing with the air pressure and I said I'm going to wake up at 5 in the morning, I'm going to get as much research as I can and I'm going to stake out a position because this looked bad for the Patriots, it looked bad for Brady and I just said if this is how it's going to be, there's no evidence to go on, but if this is how people are going to view us, embrace it. Like, okay, now we're the wrestling villain. Now we're the ones who walk into the arena going, yeah, I'm cheating, I'm taking the air out of footballs, so whatever. And as I wrote that article and I, I hit save, I was listening to the EEI morning show, and one of the guys said, if I'm like Thornton, I'm embracing this right now. I go, yes, okay. And I, my first line on my obituary, I wanted to say, was right about the flake gate from minute one. I never once had to change my position, and I'm proud of that. Um, yeah, and you, you just... Brady, Brady. Oh, oh, yeah. The thing is, oh, so Brady gives that press conference that has been long since lampooned. Remember, SNL did a whole thing about it, which, by the way, was the most ridiculous press conference in the history of journalism, where guys are saying, Tom, can you look into that mic, into that camera and apologize to people and say things like, people want to know, Tom, what's up with their hero? Well, they were still operating off of the bad intel that the balls were that underinflated, which was not true. So he had no idea. Like he wasn't, he wasn't lying. He just was, you know, he's being accused of this crime that we didn't know at the time was just caused by the cold. I mean, it's already begun, by the way. My Facebook, my Twitter feed blows up with people showing me pictures of their dashboard where they get the low tire pressure sign. I get it a million times this year, and I just answer everyone back. Are you sure it wasn't the Patriots letting the air out, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so the, the third part of this question, the second best game ever played in the old crappy stadium is uh, it was the snowplow game, is what it's known, where the Patriots were bad then. I think they were a six-win team. They were playing Don Shula's Dolphins. Don Shula, the winningest coach of all time. And the score was 0-0. Zero, zero because the field was a sheet of ice. It was like trying to play football on the on a skating rink. And the, the kickers kept trying field goals and they couldn't get their footing and the ball's going all over the place. So the Pats line up for a field goal and they had had a John Deere tractor there clearing the, the yard markers. And their coach, Ron Meyer, sends the thing out onto the field. It, it was a, like a John Deere tractor with a big scrub brush on the front. Sends it out there to clear off some spot so John Smith, their kicker, could get some footing, while Don Shula went insane on the other sidelines because I, I mean, you can't do this, and the officials were like, "There's no rule saying you can't." You know, it was like that Bugs Bunny cartoon, like, "Show me in the rule book where it says an elephant can't play baseball." Um, well, a couple things about that: the the tractor actually belonged to the team's general manager, Buck O'Kilroy. He brought it from home. Because God forbid, you know, they sent an intern down to, you know, Sears with 1200 bucks to buy their own, you know. Um, two, I, I was talking to a group of guys like you uh, one time, and a guy says, do you know who drove that snowplow? And I go, yes. Now, I, I shouldn't. There's no way my brain should have retained this knowledge, but it did. His name was Mark Henderson. And the guy says, do, do you know where he was from? I go, yes. He was on work release from Walpole Prison. <laughs> And the guy says, do you know what he was in jail for? I go, oh, now you got me. He goes, he broke into my house. <laughs> Claim of fame, eh? It's a crush with greatness. And, by the way, and to show you how bad they were back then, they won that game three to nothing. But again, they were like a six and ten team. That tractor is hanging from the ceiling of their museum down by the stadium. 
Like, it's when you go to the Smithsonian and they've got, like, the Wright Brothers plane, like, oh, yeah, this is this historic relic. And when they closed the stadium, they invited Mark Henderson out there for this big thing, like, you know, all right, he's a petty thief, everybody, but he drove that plow. Thanks, thanks for asking about that. Yes, sir. To go back to the flight gate a little bit. Shoot. People on the radio calling you, they didn't understand whether it was pressure or weight. They thought the footballs were actually two pounds lighter. Right, they kept Not using that. Two pounds that, of pressure, two pounds of weight. Total misnomer, right. And we had on our show the guy um, who does sports science on ESPN, uh, John Brinkus, I think is his name. Smart guy, and he said... If it was true that it was two pounds per square inch removed from the ball, which we know was never the, the figure, but that's what everyone was operating off of, the weight difference is the weight of a dollar bill. And the compression on it is, the, is like a millimeter. It would make no effect at all. But what really hacked me off, and credit Patriots fans for being on top of this, someone found out that pulled the tape of earlier that year the Pats had played at Green Bay. And Chris Collinsworth and Al Michaels are doing that banter that they do during a game. And they're you know, we talked to uh, Aaron Rodgers before the game. And he says he likes to have the footballs overinflated, even above the legal limit. And hope the officials don't catch it because he likes to throw the ball when it's more overinflated. Anyone remember that national scandal? Like, what was the difference? Like, what was the but it didn't matter then. No one remembered it because that's just one of those things that you say during a game goes in one ear and out the other. But because it was the Patriots, because it was Tom Brady, then it was a capital crime, and and the full brunt of the law must be brought down upon upon this guy. They've lost two number one draft picks over nothing, and they still win. They've got rules changes. They still win. They got Tom Brady suspended. They still win, and it's been a glorious thing to say. But you're at, you're absolutely right about everyone being dead wrong about that. You know. Yes, sir. The only thing I don't understand about that whole thing is why did they fire that equipment manager guy or did he leave or play? Yeah, I, I don't believe that they did, sir. I, my, my understanding is that they um, just these guys had been interviewed by Ted Wells, is the guy who was basically a gun for hire whose job it was to prosecute the Patriots. It wasn't an investigation, it was a prosecution flat out. Those two guys got interviewed by him, then got interviewed again. And then again, after four times, the Patriots said, you know what, enough, enough. And Ted Wells came to him and said, oh, we found out new information. But, you know, it's a, it, you know, any lawyer will tell you it doesn't work like that. You don't just keep getting more bites at the apple. From what I understand, what the Pats did was they were working elsewhere in the craft organization. I think they were working for the... Um, for the revolution, the soccer game, uh, soccer team. But I believe they've been brought back. And let's keep in mind, one of those guys was, uh, he was just a game day employee. You know, he, he works like the two preseason games and the eight uh, regular season games or whatever, playoff games at home, and didn't travel on the road with them or whatever. The other guy was like an assistant. And, and they made so much noise about, oh, Brady's claiming they didn't even know who that guy was. Well, again, he's a game day employee, like, but Tom Brady's the most important human being on the planet Earth. I never know that. <laughs> Let me just interject here, too. I don't know if you picked up on this, but I like Tom Brady probably, probably more than I should. <laughs> this kid's here, so I'll keep this, like, very G-rated, but my brother, to clean this up a lot, calls me one day, and he doesn't even say hello. I just, hey, what's up? He goes, all right, here's the deal. You could be Brady married to Giselle, or you could be Justin Verlander from the Astros, married to Kate Upton, who would you rather be? And I said, out of those names you gave me, I think I'd most want to be Giselle. <laughs> so, dude, that's the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my whole life. But, you know. um, so yeah, I think with, the, with those two guys, they were just private citizens that wanted no part of this. They went through their texts. They found texts going back three years with these guys, and they, they don't cast them in the best light. I mean, nobody here should have their private communications put out in front of the world. These poor guys did, and it, they're talking smack about Brady and their F-bombing, and they just sounded dopey. And I know this. Every guy I know immediately went through his phone and just started deleting old text <laughs> chains because we all would have looked like idiots. So I just feel bad for those guys. But nowhere in those texts did they find, hey, 
Brady has asked me to underinflate the footballs, and in exchange for that, he's going to give me some stuff. It's more significant the stuff they didn't find than the stuff that they claim to have found. And by the way, I'm part of a documentary that's coming out called Four Games in Fall. It's by this legit filmmaker who, her last, she's not even a football fan, she just thinks it's a fascinating story. Like her last documentary was about um, mammograms and how they're not predictive of breast cancer or whatever. And so the documentary is like Michael McCann, a professor from UNH, uh, Robert Blecker, who is on 60 Minutes, he's from NYU, uh, MIT professors, and one idiot from Weymouth sitting in an Irish bar talking about how much he hates Roger Goodell. <laughs> so, so you can guess which one I am. So, so uh, look for that. But it's, a, it's an amazing story, and I thank God for it. Boy, did that give us a lot to talk about during, during the day. You know? you know, and, and the fact that it ended with Brady, like basically deep pants and Roger Goodell in front of the whole world with a 25 uh, point comeback made it all the sweeter. Yes, sir. How do you, what do you think of the uh, Brady Belichick relationship? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people think they'll retire together, other people think, you know, it's uh, not as close as people like to believe. Yeah, I, it, there's been so much this off season about just how negative and divided it was and how, I mean, this whole 2018 has felt like an after-school special. You know, you're like, my parents are fighting, like, why? No, we're having a discussion. No, you're fighting. I've spent a lot of time this year, like, face down on my pillow with my hands over my hands going, make it stop! Um, I think it's probably contentious, and there's some friction there, because these are two, you know, alpha males, like, two guys who are hyper-competitive and singular focused on what they've done, you know, on success, and they're not trying to get glory, and they're not trying to ingratiate themselves to people. They're also very different personalities, if you haven't picked up on that. I mean, Brady is super zen and, you know, into that book, The Four Agreements, and always trying to take the high road, and, and Belichick is a guy who would, like, you know, kill you with laser beams from his eyes, if he could, to help him win. And so I understand there's got to be friction there. At the same time, you know, they've been at this for 19 years. And I think ultimately they have that common purpose, which is to, to win. And I think they, they subjugate whatever differences they have for that purpose. And, you know, I don't need them to, like, you know, cuddle every night under their slankets and, like, you know, and what have this is us viewing parties or whatever. You know, I don't think they're the kind of guys who go to bed at night just going, no, you hang up for us. No, you hang up for us. And that's fine. And they probably, after their days are over, will probably maybe exchange Christmas cards and that's it. Um, but ultimately, they understand that each of them is the perfect person for the other one. So, as far as where they retire, I'm convinced that Brady. Is, is earmarked 45, the age of 45 for a reason. No one's ever done it before. And this whole thing he's doing, this TB12 fitness, this TB12 method, call it what you will, is his calling. You know, like a lot of celebrities get so successful at what they do, they need some other philosophy or whatever to clutch on to, whether it's Tom Cruise and his beliefs or you know, God forbid that people turn to drugs and alcohol. I think Brady's thing is to prove they're relearning everything we know about athletic performance and whatever. And I, I think he's proven it every day by just how fit he stays, how well he moves, how hard he works. I mean, he's the first one to that stadium in the morning. Think, of, think about what he's climbing out of bed from. You know what I mean? To, to go be down there to go lifting weights when other guys show up, I mean, that's, that's, that's sacrifice. That's commitment that you're not going to get, get from me. So, um, yeah, his restraining orders say no, but his eyes still say yes to me. Um, so, yeah, I think they're both going to be around for a long time to come. I hope so. I can't picture the world without them. Yes, sir. I just say, you know, the media... You know, it's gotten so wacky, especially your old station, WEI. Oh, yeah. Because all they talk about is, oh, you should trade Brady now. You know, yeah. the detail in his career. How, we, how yeah, I don't even know where they come up with this stuff from. It's, yeah, they're, they're just trying to press buttons. And, you know, and, and God bless EEI, because all they ever said is just be you. Say what you think. And I get accused of being a fanboy and, oh, you're just a big honk. Look, look, when they lose, it bothers me. I'm not just sitting here with a foam finger going, yay, team! Like, you know, 
Um, but I think there's some guys who just want the story and they just want to say negative. That's why they all believed in Deflategate from the beginning because it just made for great controversy. It was a, it was a scandal and it was like you know compelling. And it took a lot for me to take a stand and say this is nonsense. I, I was on TV the night the Wells Report came out. I was on with Felger and Ron Borges or whatever. And you know, I, I, I had Ron Borges say to me, come on. What do you think that guy was doing in the bathroom for 90 seconds? I said, peeing, Ron. I think he was peeing. That's what he's doing. Probably unlike you, he washes his hands afterwards. I don't know. And I like, fell to laugh and goes, yeah, but really, what do you think he was doing? Like, oh, I, I think there's a certain confirmation bias. Like, they don't like the Patriots because they don't play ball with them. They don't give them quotes. They're not trying to be pals with them. I like the Patriots because, like you guys, I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm emotionally invested. I'm not just after the story. I'm after, I'm after the victory. I want to... I wanna... We haven't had a duck boat parade in this town in three weeks. Do you know how that is? <laughs> oh, no, the withdrawal. Anybody else? So, so yeah. I, but by very little of what they say, they're just trying to get people like me hacked off. You know? I, I listened to Felger and Maz one day, and I, I know we're up against the time, but um, they said... Patriots aren't that good. Uh, Brady covers all the mistakes. The defense is weak. It's a down year for the league. This was the first segment after the Patriots had beaten the Falcons the night before in the Super Bowl. And they said, they're not good. The league stinks. Blah, blah, blah. Like, what would you have said if they had lost? You know, what would you have said if they were 2-14 and 14 and missed the playoffs? But this is what they do. It's to get people like us like Matt, and get us to, to listen. And I don't think these guys believe 90% of what comes out of their pie holes on a given show. You know? Are you, you? Okay. Yeah, she's giving me that, like, uh, this kid will talk all night. He's like, Don it's like Donkey from Shrek. It's getting him to shut up that's the trick. I get, I get it. But, no, thank you for your time. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for supporting me.